one of a man's oldest dreams has been the desire for space travel, to travel to other worlds. Until recently, this seemed to be an impossibility. But great new discoveries have brought us to the threshold of a new frontier, the frontier of interplanetary space. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Hello and welcome to Theme Park History, the channel for everything to do with theme parks. Old and new, big and small. In today's episode, we blast off on a rip-roaring rocket into the furthest reaches of outer space as we explore Space Mountain, an indoor roller coaster that opened at Disney's Magic Kingdom on January 15, 1975. Disneyland on May 27, 1977. Tokyo Disneyland on April 15, 1983. Disneyland Paris on June 1, 1995 and Hong Kong Disneyland on September 12th, 2005. This attraction was suggested by all these space travelers, so thank you to everyone for the comments. When it comes to which attractions have had such a major impact at Disney parks, Space Mountain is on the top of that list. Ahead of its time when first conceived by Walt Disney and Imagineers, the first ever indoor steel roller coaster takes guests on a high-flying adventure to the deepest reaches of the cosmos, flying past shooting stars, roaring past streaking orbs of light, and feeling the pull of gravity as they're drawn into a swirling wormhole. While praised for its revolutionary design when it first opened in the early 1970s, the attraction is still as popular as ever 45 years later. So since we covered the first roller coaster to open at Disneyland in the last episode, it only makes sense to next take a look at the first to open at the Walt Disney Resort. Resort. Oh no, this is it, isn't it? After two years, they finally found me. Disney is finally here to shut it all down. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Wonder if they're gonna ban me from the parks and take away my Disney Plus account as well. Supreme Leader Iger, if that's you, can you just give me a minute to explain? Wait a minute. Jimmy Good from Critical Reviews? What are you doing here? This isn't supposed to be a crossover episode. Hey Jack, sorry for interrupting, but I heard you're going to explore Space Mountain, which is my favorite attraction in Magic Kingdom. Do you think I can help you out with the episode? Uh, yeah, no problem, Jimmy. I actually can use a helping hand with this attraction, as there's a lot to cover. Why don't you start us off while I make sure I'm in the clear from Mickey and his army of broomsticks, aka his lawyers. He's very protective of any of his properties. The story of the most thrilling rocket ride in the galaxy begins 16 years before its first launch. On June 14, 1959, the first major expansion at the happiest place on Earth took place. Known as the second opening of Disneyland, the date marked the opening of three brand new attractions, but Disneyland all-wag monorail system, submarine voyage, and the Matterhorn bobsleds, whose thrill level required the creation of a whole new tier of attraction admission ticket, the E-Ticket. Of the three, the Matterhorn by far was the most popular, as it was both the park's first thrill ride and roller coaster. The success of the thrilling, high-speed ride through the Matterhorn led to Walt Disney exploring the creation of other thrill rides for the park. Walt would decide on placing the next thrill ride at the happiest place on Earth within Tomorrowland, as the land's original concept was altered and trimmed back due to time constraints and budget cuts. When it opened with the rest of the park on July 17th, 1955, The Land of Tomorrow was nothing more than a showcase of corporate sponsorships, featuring the Monsanto Company, American Motors, Richfield Oil, and Dutch Boy Paint. Even with the addition of the three new e-ticket attractions opening within the land in 1959, Walt still wasn't satisfied with the state of Tomorrowland, as the corporate-sponsored area already felt outdated just a few years into its lifespan. In order to transform Tomorrowland into a vision of the future, Walt decided the entire area would be rebuilt with new attractions and scenery. As part of his vision for this new Tomorrowland, Walt would approach Imagineer John Hench in 1960 about the idea for an attraction that could become the cornerstone of the revamped area. Known as Spaceport, the attraction would be similar to the Matterhorn bobsleds, but instead of a thrilling bobsled ride through the Swiss mountain, guests would travel through space with its own Space Age inspired mountain. Wet Enterprises would once again work with Aero Engineering, who helped design the Matterhorn's ride system in developing the attraction. While the first ever steel roller coaster consisted of two separate ride tracks with their own unique layouts, the original design for the Spaceport was to feature four different ride tracks, each heading in and out of the mountain, just like the Matterhorn. 
popcorn. However, due to limited technology at the time, along with space limitations in Disneyland, the design was impossible to create. The spaceport roller coaster concept would eventually be put on hold in 1965 as Walt and Wet Enterprises focused their attention on the Florida Project, better known as the creation of Walt Disney World. While the Magic Kingdom was a success when it officially opened on October 1st, 1971, the park did have its flaws, specifically Tomorrowland. Just like when it opened at Disneyland in 1955, Tomorrowland, at the most magical place on Earth, didn't offer guests much to do. Besides the Skyway, the only other attraction in the area was the Grand Prix Raceway. With the park's ever-growing popularity, specifically with teenagers and young adults, Imagineers decided to begin development of thrill rides for the park, as it lacked any sort at the time. The original plan called for a copy of the Matterhorn bobsleds to be built within Fantasyland, but was dropped due to a lack of space within the area and an expensive price tag to recreate the attraction. Instead of replicating the Matterhorn, Imagineers returned to the spaceport ride concept, as not only the technology required for the roller coaster had improved significantly since the initial design phases in 1964, but the needed space to build the attraction was available within Tomorrowland. Needing help to cover the bill for the spaceport, Card Walker, the CEO of Walt Disney Productions at the time, along with Imagineers John Hench and Marty Sklar, approached Robert Sarnoff, the chairman of the major American electronics company RCA, to sponsor it. Already in a working relationship with Disney to provide communications hardware throughout the Walt Disney World Resort, RCA agreed to a deal to become the attraction's sponsor, providing $10 million. With the roller coaster now officially greenlit, the spaceport concept was officially renamed to Space Mountain, with construction beginning on December 15, 1972. While it was supposed to be built in the southern portion of Tomorrowland, the attraction would be built just outside the boundary line of the Magic Kingdom, as Imagineers wanted more space to build other attractions within the land, as well as not wanting the mountain to overshadow the park's centerpiece, Cinderella's Castle. Because of its new location, a tunnel to enter the attraction was built under the tracks of the Walt Disney World Railroad. Even though the final design of the cone-shaped mountain had already been decided by Imagineers years before the attraction was greenlit, the possibility of a dome-shaped mountain was at one time proposed, as it would have been cheaper and easier to build. In order to construct the mountain, four large support beams were first installed, followed by a ring of columns that would hold the structural beams to create the mountain's cone design. Each concrete beam, all 72 of them, are identical, weighing 74 tons and measuring 117 feet long with a base width of 13 feet that narrows to 4 feet at the top. Standing at 183 feet tall, 300 feet in diameter, and occupying over 85,000 square feet, the mountain is one of the largest show buildings ever created for a Disney Disney Park. Just like with the Matterhorn bobsleds, Disney would team up with Arrow Engineering to help build the roller coaster. Space Mountain shares some similarities to its predecessor, the Matterhorn, as each roller coaster features a tubular steel track design, relying on gravity once the train has reached the top of the lift hill and brakes for safety throughout various portions of the ride. While originally intended to have four different ride tracks, the roller coaster would end up only having two due to both both budget and spacing constraints. The two tracks known as Alpha and Omega are almost identical, as each track is a mirror image of the other, both reaching a max height of 65 feet, a max drop of 26 feet, a max speed of 28.7 miles per hour, and a ride duration of two and a half minutes. The only difference between the two is Alpha's track is 10 feet longer than Omega's, 3,196 feet compared to 3,180 six. The ride has 32 two-car trains, 16 for each track, though only 14 are in operation at any given time. Again like the Matterhorn, each train consists of two single-file rocket-shaped cars that feature two seats, designed to hold two passengers per seat for a total of eight passengers per train. These trains would be used until 1989 when new trains were installed, now featuring three single seats per car, reducing the total number of passengers per train to six. Besides the changes made to the seating arrangement, lap bars were also installed for these trains until they were replaced in 1998 with a T-bar style design. The roller coaster features the first of its kind ride system that allows computers to use a unique braking system, one that is able to detect the position of each ride vehicle on the track, 
determining when to launch the next ride vehicle as well as figuring out the distance between each one. This braking system used to measure distances would be installed as part of the Matterhorn's massive refurbishment in 1977 and has become the standard for most roller coasters across the world. Besides being the first ever roller coaster at the Magic Kingdom, it's also the world's first indoor steel roller coaster as well. Since the attraction takes place in the dark, the speed and drops of the roller coaster feel much faster and more intense, as guests are not able to properly prepare themselves for what the ride has to offer. With a price tag of anywhere between 15 to 20 million dollars, Space Mountain would officially open at the Magic Kingdom on January 15, 1975. The grand opening ceremony featured a 2,000-piece band, fireworks, a balloon launch, and astronaut Colonel James Irwin, who served as the Apollo Lunar Module pilot for Apollo 15 and was the eighth person to walk on the moon, taking the first official ride. Because it was the sponsor of Space Mountain, RCA was allowed to advertise the company throughout certain parts of the attraction. When guests first entered the attraction, they were greeted by RCA's mascot, a Jack Russell Terrier named Nipper. Besides the space traveling Nipper and his own spaceship, the RCA theme song, Here's to the Future and You, would play as well. The Star Tunnel would feature various displays advertising RCA products that were updated throughout the sponsorship. Besides the entrance and star tunnel, guests would exit through RCA's Home of Future Living, a moving walkway with scenes featuring audio animatronics and many products of the future, including laptops and flat-screen televisions. The post-show would remain the same until it was refurbished in 1985, now called RYCA-1, showing what life might be like living in a space colony on another planet. Besides the changes made to the post-show, RCA also removed the Here's to the Future and You theme, replacing it with a more generic music track that was used until the company ended its sponsorship in 1993. When FedEx became the new sponsor of the attraction starting in 1994, not much was changed besides the company replacing the RCA signage with their own and modifying the post-show to emphasize intergalactic shipping with packages being sent across space. With FedEx not renewing its sponsorship deal when it ended 10 years later in 2004, most of the company's logos and themes were removed, leaving the attraction without a sponsor ever since. The post-show would stay the same until 2009 when it and the rest of the attraction received major upgrades and changes. The scenes were now more directly connected to the spaceport theme, focusing on the promotion of different destinations around the universe which the rockets could take guests, adding monitors to the dioramas to promote activities guests could partake in if they were to visit. The last change to take place to the post-show was in 2018 with the removal of the moving walkway, which had been part of it since opening in 1975, replacing the walkway with carpet instead. We just got off of Space Mountain. Scariest ride I've ever been on. You're in the dark, you're going round and round, up and down, looking at the stars. We almost went and hit the ceiling, I'm sure, at one time. It's great, gotta ride it. Located within Tomorrowland, guests make their way to Starport 75, home to Tomorrowland Station MK-1, an intergalactic spaceport that serves the many residents of the galaxy in their planetary travels, which is enclosed within the mountain itself. As they make their way through the queue, guests enter the Star Tunnel, which was built under the Walt Disney World Railroad and actually leads into the ride building. The tunnel features distorted windows full of stars that give the illusion of movement as guests walk by, along with star maps showing various intergalactic space destinations. Heading out from the tunnel, guests find themselves in the Star Corridor, which has more windows with views of various planets and spaceships. From 2009 to 2018, the corridor also featured 90-second video games guests could play, hosted by a robot that operates Space Mountain's Mission Control Center. Arriving at Mission Control, the queue splits into two lines for the Alpha and Omega loading stations, where guests board their six-passenger rocket. Once all guests 
Master on board. The rocket leaves the loading station and ascends up the super space tunnel, which infuses the rocket with enough energy for the journey through the stars. Out of the tunnel, the rocket makes its way up the launch dock, where astronauts are hard at work repairing the CMB-2000 rocket while the people mover moves through directly between the Alpha and Omega tracks. Once the rocket reaches the top of the launch dock, it makes a small quick dip before plunging into numerous twists and turns as guests travel around the mountain in near complete darkness, including the roller coaster's steepest drop of 39 degrees. The ride ends with the rocket passing through a red swirling wormhole before arriving back at Tomorrowland Station MK-1. Back at the station, guests on board from their rocket and pass through a walkway that leads back to Tomorrowland, which features a baggage claim, the robot manned command center, and various dioramas advertising other destinations guests can visit. Once they exit from the walkway, guests enter the Tomorrowland Light and Power Company gift shop, where merchandise from the attraction is sold. The two and a half minute long attraction has been a huge hit with guests, as many have praised the roller coasters. No, you know what? This doesn't feel right. Hang on just one minute. Jimmy, Space Mountain is your favorite attraction. Instead of me just checking reviews on Yelp, why don't you tell us in your own words why you love it so much? Jack, I love Space Mountain for a myriad of reasons. First of all, I find the building itself, the sign, the queue line, and the rockets to all be very aesthetically pleasing in a wonderfully retro-futuristic sort of way. The fact that this ride is completely enclosed makes it very easy to lose touch with the outside world, which I adore as well. Essentially, it's two Mad Mouse roller coasters in the dark. On the surface, that isn't much to shock and awe park goers, but the build-up and setting make it so immersive that even without a prominent plotline, you can't help but be sucked into the whole experience. It still feels like you're riding on a piece of, dare I say it, theme park history. The more I learn about it, the more I respect how precious this attraction is to the very foundation of what makes up any Magic Kingdom. Lastly, the music in the beginning and middle of the queue line is pitch perfect when it comes to setting a striking space tone. Basically, I have an ever-growing fondness for this mysterious cosmic adventure, and just thinking about it gets me amped up for future visits. So Jimmy, I think that about wraps it up for Space Mountain. Do you just want me to get to the part where I talk about how Hyperspace Mountain is nothing but Disney trying to cash in on the popularity of the Star Wars franchise? Actually, that pretty much sums up the sequel trilogy now that I think about it. Uh, what about the other Space Mountain attractions? You know the ones located at other Disney parks? I feel that if you're going to talk about the original, you have to at least mention the rest. But that's like four more Space Mountains I would have to talk about. That's a lot of space to cover. No, nothing for space as a pun? Man, my jokes are falling flat this year. All right, how about we split it in half? I'll talk about Anaheim and Japan while you talk about Paris and Hong Kong. Well, since you're putting in half the work, it sounds like a deal to me. Just don't go bashing Hyperspace Mountain. That was my idea. Jettison Disneyland 1, Space Mountain, code 2. Clear for takeoff. Instrumentation? Instrumentation, go. All personnel, clear the launch platform. Space Mountain. It can only happen at Disneyland. Experience it now! Following the success of the interstellar roller coaster at the Magic Kingdom, it was decided to finally fulfill Walt's plan to build Space Mountain at Disneyland, with construction beginning in early 1976. A major hurdle Imagineers faced was redesigning the entire attraction in order to accommodate the lack of space within Tomorrowland. The mountain is only 200 feet in diameter and 118 feet tall. Actually, the entire structure was built 17 feet into the ground to keep the peak from throwing off the park's scale, which would have dominated Main Street. The biggest change made to the Disneyland version was replacing the Magic Kingdom's dual track layout with just one instead. Even with all the changes that were forced to be made to the Disneyland version, the attraction features an original track layout, original special effects, and actually is faster, taller, and longer than the Magic Kingdom's version, reaching a max speed of 32 miles per hour, a max height of 75 feet, track length of 3,035 feet, and is 2 minutes 35 seconds long. The Disneyland version also features two major differences when it comes to its entrance and roller coaster trains. Unlike having to enter the attraction through an underground tunnel, guests actually ascend up into the side of the mountain, where they eventually board the more traditional 
coaster train that features side-by-side -side seating instead of single file. With a price tag of $20 million, Space Mountain, along with the 1,100-seat Tomorrowland stage, the 670-seat Space Place restaurant, and the Starcade would officially open at Disneyland on May 27, 1977. Just like it was at the Magic Kingdom, the attraction was a massive success, breaking the attendance record for most guests visiting Disneyland in one day and the Memorial Day weekend attendance record, with the park hosting 185,500 guests over the three-day period. While there were sponsors and minor changes throughout the years, the attraction remained the same until it closed down on April 10, 2003, as the ride had become unstable and needed a complete track replacement. The ride track was completely rebuilt with the exact same layout that was originally designed in 1976. After a year and a half refurbishment, the attraction would officially reopen on July 15, 2005, just two days before the 50th anniversary of Disneyland, with a reopening ceremony featuring the first person to ever walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong. Besides the new track, the updated attraction featured new rocket trains, new special effects, a new storyline, and new original composition by composer Michael Giacchino that is synchronized to the ride. Because of the attraction's success in Florida and Anaheim, it was all but a foregone conclusion that Space Mountain would be a cornerstone of any future Disney park. The attraction would make its way next to Tokyo Disneyland, opening with the park on April 15, 1983. While the park was heavily influenced to be similar to the Magic Kingdom, its Space Mountain is actually a near replica of the Disneyland version. The mountain's height and diameter are the same as its Anaheim counterpart, along with the track layout, train design, special effects, and elements. The attraction would remain the same until it closed down in October of 2006 in order to undergo a five-month refurbishment. When the attraction reopened on April 28, 2007, it now featured a more sci-fi futuristic theme overall, including new special effects, as well as a new loading station that features a futuristic spaceship hanging from the ceiling. Your destination, outer space. Your speed, astronomical. Your closest encounter, asteroids. Between the Earth and the Moon lies the adventure. Space Mountain, the greatest ride in the universe at Disneyland Paris. The fourth version of the attraction would arrive 12 years later at Disneyland Paris and is the most unique of them all. Space Mountain, du la Tele à Lune, wouldn't be inspired by the Space Age, but instead by the ideas of space travel from the perspective of Jules Verne and his 1865 novel From the Earth to the Moon. With a price tag of $90 million, Space Mountain, From the Earth to the Moon, would officially open at Disneyland Paris on June 1st, 1995. Located within Discoveryland, the mountain is steampunk themed, with a Columbiad cannon attached to the plate and rivet exterior which is covered in copper and brass. It's the only space mountain to feature multiple inversions, a launch, a section of track that exits and re-enters the interior, and was the first to feature a synchronized onboard audio track. While it was a huge hit with guests, From the Earth to the Moon would close on January 15, 2005, in order to transform the roller coaster to be similar in theme to the Space Mountains in America and Japan. Space Mountain Mission 2 would officially open on April 9th, 2005, removing the Jules Verne theming and story altogether. While the track layout wasn't changed, many special effects from the original version of the attraction were replaced, including the onboard audio track. As part of the 25th anniversary celebration of Disneyland Paris, it was announced on October 17th, 2016, that Mission 2 would close down to become Star Wars Hyperspace Mountain, in which guests join the Rebel Alliance and hurtles through the Star Wars galaxy, following the twists and turns of X-Wings, TIE Fighters, and a Star Destroyer. Hyperspace Mountain would officially open on May 7, 2017. While rumored to finally shut down sometime in 2020 in order to transform the roller coaster back to Mission 2, there's been no official confirmation at this time. The fifth and final Space Mountain would open with Hong Kong Disneyland on September 12, 2005. 
Just like in Tokyo, the attraction is a near replica of the Disneyland version, featuring the same track layout and soundtrack. A major distinction for this attraction is a small loading area, as unlike in Disneyland where Tokyo Disneyland, there's no mission control. What makes this Space Mountain stand out compared to the others is that it was the first to premiere Ghost Galaxy, a seasonal Halloween overlay of the attraction, featuring an evil space spirit trying to cause havoc in the stars. The the attraction would implement new lights, audio tracks, and eerie projections to scare guests. The event was such a huge hit when it debuted in 2007 that it would make its way to Disneyland two years later. The attraction would be transformed to Hyperspace Mountain on June 11, 2016, and while it was only supposed to be temporary like the other versions were, it would become the ride's permanent theme complete with the addition of a full-size replica X-Wing, fully refurbished queue, and a meet-and-greet area. So there you have it, a brief summary of the other Space Mountain attractions. While each is unique in its own way, the one thing they all have in common is every ride is a cornerstone of the park they're located in, taking guests on a high-speed journey, racing through the cosmos to the edge of the galaxy and back. When it comes to classic Disney attractions, Space Mountain is one of the greatest and most influential ever built. Tomorrowland's signature attraction has been thrilling millions of guests all over the world at five different Disney theme parks. Starting at the Magic Kingdom over 45 years ago, rocketing them into outer space aboard the first ever indoor roller coaster dark ride. What's most impressive about Space Mountain is how after all these years, the attraction is still a must ride whenever visiting a Disney park, cementing its place as a cultural icon that will forever be timeless. So that is a theme park history of Space Mountain. Jimmy, thank you so much for being part of this episode and helping me out. I had a great time working together. Where can people find more of your stuff? If you're interested in hearing my voice some more or seeing me in the Disney parks vlogging it up, please go check out Critical Reviews. I cover a wide variety of entertainment topics such as theme parks, video games, and movies. Hope to see you there. Also, thank you, Jack, for having me. It's a true honor and pleasure, especially as a fan, to be a part of this great channel. Fantastic. Make sure to check out Jimmy's stuff when you get the chance. A special shout out to all the theme park fanatics on my Patreon in the description down below. As always, thank you for watching the video and supporting the channel. Don't don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if there's any attraction you would like us to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, hey Rick, play us out. You are next. Oh, is that a play? Just wait a minute. Wait a minute, Tony. You're next, and I got news for you. When you get on Space Mountain, you'll be like this.